Hello everyone, Wylock here, fresh off completing construction of the complete Tomb of Horrors. That one done, I need a new mega project to occupy my time, and it's going to be White Plume Mountain. Let's waste no time and dive right in. Here is the map from the first edition module, the original printing. Okay. Now here's the map from the fifth edition collection, Tales from the Yawning Portal. It's in color, that's nice, but kind of bland. Still, I think this is the version that most of you are likely to run at your table in the year 2021 or beyond. So it's the one I'll be pulling the text from as we go through this project. But here's the map from the third edition adaptation. Gorgeous. I like this one the best. And since you and I are about to be referencing this image a lot over the next however many videos, I want to go with one that's aesthetically pleasing. A couple things though, there's this connection over in hallway 25 that isn't there in this version of the map. Now since it is there in the first and fifth edition adaptations, I'm going to guess this is either a printing error or a design choice that I'm going to make a manual edit there. Also, there's a lot of unnecessary bigness in this map, and that's true for any version. So I've looked at each room and each hallway for where there is unnecessary bigness and where the text does not talk about dimensions. I want to stay consistent with what's in the text. So after I did all that, here's the original third edition map. And here is my condensed version. By doing this, we lose none of the flavor, none of the mechanical impacts, and none of the intents of the original dungeon design. Plus I can make a hell of a lot less tiles. So once again, here's the original. And here is my modified photoshopped condensed version. This will be the map that we refer to in this project. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all true tiles lines. Next, let's talk about general architecture. Unless otherwise noted in the module text, the dungeon will have a consistent aesthetic look. But I, and I think you, are getting sick of seeing my usual speckled gray cardboard squares for the default look for a room. So let's go directly to the module text. All corridors in the dungeon are 10 feet in height and have been carved out of, and in some places, seemingly melted through solid rock. Right, off we go. Double corrugated cardboard for my tile foundations, as always. Great because it's a quarter inch thick, so it's a useful standard. The walls will be a half inch tall and glued on top of the tile instead of on the side. And that's because, well, you'll see in a minute, we're going to be wrapping it with tin foil, so we're going to have plenty of strength. Anyway, using the usual one and a quarter inch space form factor, so this tile, for example, is two and a half inches wide. You can fit a large miniature in this hallway. Alum aluminium, aluminum, aluminum foil. Crinkle it up good, shiny side down. And then I'm using hot glue. You could use white glue or any glue of your choice. But a hot glue gun on low temperature, this is very doable and you won't hurt yourself. You sort of get a knack for it. So I use that and coat the whole tile with aluminum foil. Now this does create some additional thickness, maybe a millimeter or so. So in truth, when I did all the cardboard cutting, I left it like a millimeter short. I cut it a little bit light so that it's still all going to meet up after that thickness is added from the tin foil and the hot glue. Mod Podge. You could use a spray primer here. Trust me, from experience, it's not strong enough. Mod Podge is the way to go to start with on aluminum foil, otherwise your paint's gonna chip. This is not watered down, it's straight out of the bottle. Fairly thick coat, not so much that it's gonna clog up the details, but a fairly thick coat of Mod Podge. And then I put that outside to dry. Next up is flocking. So you can see the Mod Podge dries very clear. This has had it applied and it's been drying for like an hour. Now white glue just along the floor and I'm gonna put on my typical fine mixed sand. This is a construction sand. You could use any type of sand, whatever you use is gonna work fine. Don't try and cheat it in one step. So don't do this with the wet Mod Podge. Wait for it to dry, then do glue. It's just gonna be a much stronger result. Plus, you'll have wet Mod Podge on the walls, and you'll get sand on the walls. 
Now that sand doesn't need to be dry, moving right along a very thick bead of white glue in the corner where the wall meets the floor. There you can see a nice thick bead and then small aggregate pebbles. And I'm sort of stuffing them in there with my fingers to get as much contact area as possible. This is done on both sides. That I set aside overnight to dry and it looks like this, pretty good. With a fairly stiff bristled brush and a good amount of pressure, I'm going over the dried piece and just shucking off all of the sand and pebbles that didn't get adhered or partially adhered that, you know, that would break off when I eventually go to paint. I don't want that happening. So just a quick once over here with a stiff bristled brush is going to solve that problem ahead of time. There we go. Nice. Outside, spraying with a flat black primer. Here it is all dry. It's got a bit of gloss to it. I don't know if that's because of the underlying smoothness of the Mod Podge or if it's because I put this directly in the sun to speed dry. Uh, so don't do that. But either way, it doesn't matter because I'm about to paint with acrylic craft paint anyway. Here we go. With a fairly wet brush, you can see it's pretty well loaded with water. I'm going to start slathering black on there. And the reason for that is so that it spreads out easier and so that we can do some wet blending, which is coming up. Here it is, still very wet, and I've got a medium gray. I'm going to dapple on a few spots, going back and forth to the water. It's okay if this is very sloppy. In fact, that's what we want. I'm trying to wet blend these together. So just dappling where gray meets black. Uh, no, not really swiping, just dappling. Otherwise, you're going to end up mixing them together. You'll just get a dark gray. I want a little bit of variation, a little bit of undertone for the forthcoming dry brush. You can see it there on the upper wall, what it, what it looks like once I've sort of swirled it around a little bit. Now, the floor is a plain medium brown. It's just brown, very simple. And again, keeping it very wet and I'm going to wet blend where it meets the rocks. So I'm not painting the rocks brown, but once I dapple at the perimeter, that gray and black and brown will sort of mix there. It's just all gonna look, hopefully, very natural, like you've carved it out of a mountain and there's mud on the ground, like the text says. So here it is, very wet, very sloppy. It's gonna be put outside under the sun to speed dry in about 15 minutes. And here it is dry. Notice how much less vibrant it is. That's universally true with really any kind of paint, but this is just, ooh, those undertones, I have a feeling are going to pop very nicely. This color is called Barnwood. It's like a perfect grayish. It is literally halfway between beige and gray. And so I'm gonna use that on the whole tile to sort of tie everything together. And there it is, yes, so satisfying. Believe it or not, these tiles I find are actually easier and more fun to make than my usual uh, cardboard square tiles like I did in Tomb of Horrors and I've done in all my dungeons. First of all, there's no carpal tunnel from cutting all those chipboard squares. Uh, but secondly, doing all that wet work, the wet blending, um, it, it's just fun. It's something I don't usually do. Look at these earth tones. This is much more complex and better looking than my usual go-to stuff. So glad I tried something new. So that's the look. Give it a nice healthy coat of clear coat and it's done. That's the standard look for the dungeon. Now let's talk about stairs. What's our standard stair approach gonna be? They are a 3D element being represented here on a 2.5D plane. So what I did is cut some chipboard rectangles and you can see I put a sliver down there first to start a ramp and then I put the treads on and they overlap each other a little bit to sort of give the illusion of which way is up on the stairs. There you go, it's a good side view. And painted right, I, th I think this will work. However, it then occurred to me that I need to do all the tin foil work first. So I tore these back out and then did the whole tile with its tin foil, as usual, as described earlier. And then each step gets its own wrap of tin foil, like a piece of candy. For the bottom one, I pre-attach that little sliver that's going to start the ramp. And then those are glued in sequentially, overlapping each other just like before. Notice there's bare cardboard on the left. That's at the top of the stairway. That's the landing. So I'm thinking I want the tinfoil to overlap the top step 
and hopefully kind of blend it together a little bit. Otherwise, it looks like there's a, a an inverted tread leading to nowhere, if that makes sense. Anyway, here's a good view. Nice. Yeah, I think this will work. Although we are underground in natural stone, uh, I wish I had given some waviness to those treads instead of flat front edges. That's a missed opportunity. All right, anyway, let's move on. For finishing steps, I do not flock them. Instead, they just get the normal dry brush. And then to help sell the illusion of depth, you can water down some black paint and carefully paint in a fairly thick line there. You can also load your airbrush with black paint and put in a triangular shaped shadow like this on each side to further help emphasize which way is up and which way is down. Now, if you're gonna use some or all of these methods, it is helpful to mass produce things. Also do it in the daytime or have a fan nearby, something that can help your dry times. Pure Mod Podge will dry in under an hour if you help it along. Same with the paint. In doing all this wet blending, I put it directly under the summer sun outside and in 15 minutes it was bone dry. No warping either because we have so much junk attached to this tile. Some areas of the dungeon are flooded the water on the floor is about one foot deep and the floor itself is covered with slippery mud. Except where flights of steps lead up out of it, this scummy water covers the floors of all rooms and corridors. My preferred clear resin is this Art & Glow. It's in my supplies. There's links in the video description below. I find that it works really good. It cures basically completely in about 16 hours. A crucial tip though, Mix it exactly 50-50 and stir it a ton. If you find that it's too sticky afterwards, you probably didn't mix it enough. I, I mean, I stir for a solid five, eight minutes, something like that, aggressively, and you'll feel when it sort of pops and becomes less viscous. You wanna make sure you stir it really good. I tint it with some inks. You could use shades, but I find they don't really tint it quite enough. So I mix one part green, two parts brown of these uh, inks, and then mix it up. Now in this little cup, it looks quite opaque, right? But once it spreads out, because we are gonna do a very thin layer, once it spreads out, it becomes much more transparent and it's gonna look like murky water. And I am spreading it thin, mostly keeping it to the center of the tile and then using a popsicle stick to sort of tease it out towards the perimeters, including at the edges. This water is only one foot deep, so I think that's appropriate to scale. And by just sort of teasing it out to the edges, you can keep it very thin such that it doesn't flow off the side and you really don't need to dam up the edges. Also, we'll read later on that there are clumps of algae floating around the top. So clump foliage works for that. Took some of this olive colored stuff and just placed it in the wet resin. This is good stuff, but it is expensive. Here's just a little bit of uh, resin preparation and pouring ASMR for you. Pouring resin. Now we are pouring more resin. Oh, here's the original fork hallway. If the geometry gives you trouble, just trace out the two and a half inch grid on your double corrugated cardboard and sort of visualize it from there. You don't have to measure angles. All you have to do is connect corners on that grid you've drawn. It's a little more wasteful with regard to your double corrugated cardboard, but it's cardboard, so don't sweat it too much. Oh yes, so satisfying. Room one, the spiral staircase. It's a staircase down to the dungeon and it appears to be badly rusted, but sturdy. Tracing out some circles with a compass onto chipboard or other very thick card stock, and then bisecting them into quarters and then eighths, cutting them out and stacking them logically. I attach them with hot glue and also the bottom piece gets traced onto double corrugated cardboard for extra thickness and strength. And that also gives me some surface area to glue on a band of cardstock to wrap around the outside. After it's based black, solid base coat of gunmetal, and then I'm gonna play around with these Vallejo environmental effects, the rust effect and some mud. Just dabbing them on there without much care really doesn't bother me too much. Yeah, that looks fine.
Area two, Riddling Guardian. There is a Sphinx at the three-way intersection and it gives a riddle. Here's a beautiful 3D resin printed miniature. I forget where I got it from because it was a long time ago and I just hoard STLs and throw them into a folder. If you're the artist behind this, please post a comment below and I'll pin it. Anyway, I printed it, primed it, gave it a nice earthy brown base coat. And then with a light tan color into the airbrush, uh, this is really for those of you new to miniature painting, this is called a zenithal highlight. I'm attacking it with the airbrush from the top down. The airbrush is off camera, but I'm only spraying downwards on the model where the light would be coming from. And look at that, immediate pop of detail, gorgeous. No need for washes, insta shadows, colors are right. I like it, moving on. And then I blew it, I used this tan color, which is really sort of a hideous looking not orange and I was hoping that the wash would make it more rich but it didn't so I went back and did some layering and some highlights with a red color it's still not perfect but we'll, we'll get there anyway that's the Sphinx doesn't need a base it's just gonna go in the middle of the hallway Area three, hidden slime. Moving along the corridor that runs northeast, the floor is covered by a hidden slime because of the water. Easy enough, blob of hot glue on some cardboard, paint it up green, maybe do some highlighting, some gloss, whatever. There it is. Room four, glass globes. In the room, suspended from the ceiling by unbreakable wires, are nine silvered glass spheres, each about two feet in diameter. So I need to look to my right, to my bins o' fun, that says all my sorted, organized little treasures and bits, cool stuff that I could use. I found these. Now, these, I'll have to modify them, and they aren't perfect spheres. You can see they are faceted, much like a, a disco ball. Despite them being a little large for scale, being two feet across, I think I'm gonna go with these. So I chopped off that protrusion, drilled a hole into it, and then with some super glue, injected into there and attached a paper clip. These are the coated types of paper clips, not bare metal, very important. Some needle noses, I also just put a perfect 90 degree bend at the end for more surface area with a neodymium magnet. Yes, that is how they're gonna be attached to the ceiling. So these assemblies, I made nine of them, and they get primed up with my usual gray, and then airbrushed with silver, since they are silvered spheres. Putting those aside for the moment, it is time to make the largest clip-on feature that I have ever made. So first, graphics medium chipboard, two identical rectangles, and then a slightly smaller double corrugated rectangle to go in the middle. Specifically, it's a half inch shorter. This is what allows it to grab onto those walls. Measuring out a centered grid and marking where those neodymium magnets are going to be glued and then gluing them on. This piece, the ceiling, is attached to the wall that I had just made, the clip-on, and I cut it strategically so that the corrugation is exposed. That's important. You want the hot glue to be able to drink up into there and make a really strong connection. Also, I held this for a solid two minutes till it was truly cooled and hardened in order to get the best, strongest connection possible. Also, since this is sort of a like a cutaway effect from the room, I'm gonna put some waviness at this edge and make it look a little more organic. Then the whole feature gets the usual tinfoil treatment. It also gets painted up in the exact same way as the walls from the tiles. About this time I realized that this room actually isn't flooded on our map. The reason I made the mistake is in the fifth edition map, it is. So another inconsistency there, sort of like the hallway 25 thing. So I'm gonna have to find a way to live the rest of my life with this.
Now each of these spheres has a different thing that happens when you break it, but three of them contain creatures, which could lead to combat, so I want to have miniatures prepared for them just in case. There are three folded up shadows, an angry air elemental, and a gray ooze. The shadows are 3D printed, again they're from my STL horde, I don't remember who it was, please post if it was you. But instead of just painting them black, I'm going to airbrush them night blue, a very dark blue, and then wash with a dark tone or null oil, some kind of black wash. And boom, that's the shadow. Made three of them. The air elemental, once again 3D printed, sprayed with gray, and then airbrushed zenithal like we talked about before, a pure white would even work. Gray Ooze, I made one of these for Tomb of Horrors and I'm going to do it the same way. Cutting a small triangle out of chipboard or some other heavy card stock. And then with Sherbonder Metallic Silver Hot Glue, I'm attaching it to a base and then covering it up with that hot glue. Beautiful, perfect Gray Ooze on a medium base. An excerpt from the legend of Charaptis. Well over a millennium ago, the wizard Charaptis rose to power in the valleys of the northern mountains, bringing the local warlords under his thumb with gruesome threats. Under Charaptis's overlordship, the influx of rapacious monsters and raids from the wildest mountains decreased markedly, dwindled, and then almost stopped. Seeing this, the populace did not put up much resistance to paying the wizards heavy taxes and tithes, especially when stories were circulated of what happened to those who balked. Any nobles who protested disappeared in the night and were replaced by the next in line of succession. Gradually, as dissension was stilled, the taxes and levies became even more burdensome until eventually the wizard was taking a great piece of everything that was grown, made, or sold in the valleys, including the newborn young of livestock. Furthermore, monstrous incursions into the settled lands began to increase as raiding parties of humanoids assaulted villages, and evil and fantastic monsters appeared from nowhere to prey upon the harried peasants. At the height of this unrest, Corruptus's tax collectors came forth with word of a new levy. One third of all newborn children were henceforth to be turned over to the wizard. That edict turned out to be the tipping point. All right, so we're off to a fast start. And in truth, I've got a bunch of other tiles already constructed, so I'm well ahead of video production. Hopefully, I can keep this up with some frequency. Meantime, if you haven't already, please join us on Facebook, the Tabletop Crafters Guild, almost 40,000 members strong and growing. The idea of scratch building stuff for your tabletop gaming excites you, that's a place to be. As always, links in the video description below, including for my new merch. And thank you for joining me today. I'll see you next time. I'm Wylock, make things and play games. First off, if you only click this video to see the geysers and chains room, you can go ahead and jump to this time code. Hello everyone, Wylock here. Thanks for joining me. Welcome back to our complete build of White Plume Mountain. Stuff that's generally applicable to the dungeon was addressed in the first video. If you haven't seen that one, I recommend you check it out. But today I have four new rooms for you, so let's go jump in. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. Picking up at room number five, numbered golems. Five flesh golems are clustered against the north wall. Each has a number on its chest, five, seven, nine, 11, and 13. One of them doesn't belong and the correct choice is nine because it's not a prime number. 
This is easy. I printed and painted five of these Frankenstein-like minis to stand in as flesh golems, and they really don't have any room on their chests, but they have a nice shoulder pad feature, so I painted the numbers on those instead. And that's all of room five. Easy enough. You know, I guess the implication is that in Greyhawk, their understanding of mathematics has advanced to the point that prime numbers are recognized as a thing. Actually, this encounter further implies that they've chosen to recognize the base 10 system of numbering in the first place. And I don't know about that. I think a sufficiently advanced arch wizard, given the opportunity to start from scratch, would have chosen to recognize base 12, not base 10. There's actually a real life movement with a lot of support behind it that we should be using a duodecimal system, not the decimal system. It's called dozenalism. And it makes a lot of sense. Division is easier. It's got a lot more ties to real life applications. And it's more aligned with how our brains are hardwired. I think forcing the base 10 system on a group of creatures that you just forced to become sentient in the first place is just doubly irresponsible. But where was I? Area 6, turnstile. Short flight of stairs leads up to a dry corridor and just around the corner is a turnstile. Let's look at the artwork from the original printing of the module. Revolutionary stuff. I'm going to make a double wall clip-on. I don't think I've ever made one before. This is for two reasons. Number one, I want to represent those poles sticking out of the wall because this thing only turns counterclockwise. It'd be kind of silly to illustrate if you didn't have a way to restrict the characters just going 360 and walking back through. And also because the central pole, that central turnstile, is going to be pretty fragile. I'd like to have something to protect it. Walls will do that. So, I prepared two clip-ons as normal. Chipboard sandwiching double corrugated in the middle. Put them on the hallway so that I could measure out a true width and then cut a ceiling for that. And to give it some girth, double corrugated and chipboard again as well. I know I'll be using a wooden dowel for the central pull of the turn style, so I found the center of the ceiling and punched a hole through it. Then clad the whole thing in tin foil and gave it the usual Mod Podge and paint job that all of the other walls get. For the actual protruding bars, I'm using toothpicks. The ones coming out of the wall will come out of these like ornate bead things. I just needed something to house them and give some connective strength. So those get put in, super glued, and then the whole assembly is hot glued to the wall. Once those are in place, I could mark out on the central pole where the opposing or like teeth, the interlocking arms would go. And I used my pin vise to drill holes to put the toothpicks through, chop them to length and secure them in place just sort of by slathering with some super glue and using accelerant. Here it is dry fitted. You can see it fits perfectly. I'm not going to leave this unsecured so that it can rotate. Um, but right here in this video, if I ever want to see it, I can look back and see yeah, at one time it did rotate. The turnstile just gets a simple overbrush with gunmetal and maybe some speckling with metallic copper. I also punched a hole in the floor of the tile that this will go into. I'm okay doing this because that's all this tile is ever going to be used for. It is specifically for this dungeon. It'll be in this box. I'm never going to use it anywhere else. And this is what it looks like to clip it on. Pole goes in the ground, the two clip-ons on the wall, and this, wow, this is really, really sturdy. I love it. And man, I think it looks the part. I think it matches the original artwork really well. By that, I mean it looks really stupid being in a dungeon. Here we go, room seven, geysers and chains. The door opens onto a stone platform in a large natural cave. There's another platform on the far side and between them is a series of nine wooden discs suspended from the ceiling 50 feet above by massive steel chains. The floor is a pool of roiling, boiling mud. There's also two large geysers in that boiling mud. The discs themselves are about four feet in diameter, three feet apart. They swing freely and tilt when weight is placed upon them. And the discs and chains, as well as the walls of the cavern, are all covered with a wet, slippery algal scum that gives off a feeble phosphorescent glow. Let's get a look at the artwork side by side from each of the three printings of the module. Okay, fairly similar. Now, this tile does not need to be as big as the map makes it, even our modified map. So I'm going to make the tile as small as I can. I do have to store it after all, and I don't want to make this one in two pieces. I'd like to be self-contained. So cut out a nice big square. I think this is six by six units. Laid out a path of nine washers to kind of help myself visualize. Now, the entrance and exits still do need to be on the grid. 
for everything to line up in general. So you can see I'm measuring along the edge two and a half inches in and five inches on the other side, roughly sketching the location of everything in the walls and then going at it and cutting out the tile. The walls, as usual, are going to be a half inch tall. So I cut out a nice length and then kind of pre-bent it to the shape of the tile. Now, you want to hot glue this on a little bit at a time, say six or eight inches, so that you can use all of your fingers to hold it in place as the glue is cooling. It's not going to be possible to maintain all those curves for the entire distance at once. Texturing the walls, I'm taking a page out of my own book like we did the Underdark tiles a couple years ago. Remember that episode? If not, there's a card on the screen right now. Anyway, we lay out a thick bead of hot glue and then pull upward with the nozzle and sort of tease the hot glue upwards to give the idea of stalagmites. Once again, dry fitting the washers to mark out where I'm gonna punch each hole. And these are drink stirring sticks like you get from a party store or the dollar store. Some of them are clear, perfect for holding up the discs and making it look like they're floating or rather hanging by chains. Now, after punching a hole in the cardboard and testing, this is very flimsy, right? This is, this is not the final state. We're gonna take care of that, rest assured. For the geysers, graphics medium chipboard, cut a strip, bend it into a circle and hot glue it on. And look at these, hemispherical bead sheets. I've used these before. A lot of crafters on YouTube use these. Great for doing bubbles. There we go. A couple clusters of different sizes. And keep in mind, if you want to make something sort of look natural, don't evenly distribute things. That's not random. What is random, what tends to look better, is if you cluster things together. And then on to the good stuff. Yeah, sculpt a mold. We're going to use this to fill out the texture of the room. It's going to be two parts of the powder to one part water. mix it up real good, and then spread it on. I'm using it to sort of build a ramp for the geyser on the inside, smoothing it out with my finger. This is a heck of a lot easier to do than with hot glue, and it also is gonna look better. Same thing for the outside, sort of ramping up to it. And here's how we solve the strength problem for those clear posts. I built up sculpt -a mold around them in a small mountain, like a few millimeters high, just enough to create a keyed entry for the post. So putting a glob on there, inserting the post, and then sort of squeezing it in around it to make that small mountain. And once this dries and fully cures rock hard, my hope is that it will be a perfect keyed entry and I can remove these things at will for storage because I don't want to store them like this in the box. They're going to get beat up. Next day, fully dried and hardened, and a twist, they come out perfectly. Reinserting it, there's a little bit of resistance, good friction, perfect, yes. I love it when a plan comes together. Flawless victory. Also gonna add a little whirlpool effect within the body of the geysers. Well, let's put the tile aside for a sec and talk about the platforms. I figured out the nominal center of gravity or center of weight for a typical 28 millimeter miniature with the understanding that the chain is gonna be connected to the center. So the miniature will not be able to stand on the whole platform. They're gonna be leaning off some unless I make the platforms like really huge and I don't wanna do that. So these circles of graphics medium chipboard have a diameter of 32 millimeters. They also texture really well. Using a ballpoint pen, check this out, I'm going to create the planks of wood, and then with a very fine-tipped awl, awl, I'm going to lightly scrape and create the wood grain. Then for strength and stability, hot gluing a washer on the underside, and then the whole thing gets a Mod Podge. I was careful to spread this out kind of thin, uh, or just keep working it so that I don't fill in all that detail with gobs of Mod Podge. When trying to figure out how to do the chains, I just did a quick Google search and lo and behold, Jeremy did this already. So I'm gonna go ahead and use his technique. This is my trusty Surebonder silicone mat. Nothing sticks to it. So I laid out this chain I had around, put on some super glue and sprayed accelerant. However, 
This chain is a little bit too bulky, a little bit too big. This didn't work great. It buckled under its own weight and did not stay rigid. So I pulled out this necklace chain that I had on hand. A little smaller, doesn't quite look like a chain, but mm, that's okay. Dragging super glue along it to let it seep in, hit it with the accelerant, and this will work. So I chopped those to like a two inch length or something, and then super glued them to the discs. Painting, very easy. The chain will get gunmetal, and then the base of the disc will get burnt umber. Followed by a dry brush with a honey brown, easy. Now for that faintly phosphorescent algal scum, I went over to my rarely used Vallejo effects paints. They sent me these a couple years ago, and every so often I find something cool to do with them. I got a dark grime, a light grime, because those are different apparently, and then a moss and lichen, this yellow, which I'm hoping dries to sort of a textured thing. I'm not really sure. Here's a couple test swatches I did. But ultimately, you just got to try it. You got to go for it. So I put some on the platform. As they were drying, I could already tell I wasn't going to be super impressed with the result. So I dabbed them out and sort of faded the edges, did some dabbing. I don't know. Yeah, once it's dry, it, it basically just looks like dried mustard colored paint. I, I think that's all it is. But it could be a good base for this neon green. Being that it's yellow, I could end up with a nice, faintly phosphorescent, sickly result. So I'll give that a shot, and while that's drying, back to the tile. First up, dry brushing with a light grayish, easy enough. Oh, and letting all that detail do the work. Man, I will tell you, there's nothing more satisfying than letting your terrain do the work for you when you're painting. You put in the effort to texturize it and get as much interesting stuff in there before priming as you can, and oh, it is so fun and easy to paint. Raw Umber. This is just a nasty sort of desaturated dark brown. I'm going to use this mop brush and go nuts. Yeah, this is exactly what I was talking about a second ago. I'm going to let you have some visual ASMR for a moment. And then this color is called maple syrup, repeating the same thing as we just did. A little less paint, a little less pressure, so that I'm not covering up all of the previous color. The idea here is build up via overbrushing as opposed to building down with washes. For a final highlight color, I thought I would try like a gray after doing some Google image search. This is gray owl, but I quickly realized I, I was not happy with this. It was going to, I could just tell if I went on for the whole thing, it was going to ruin it. So I quickly took a rich brown, this is bark brown, whatever, and mixed it like 50-50 with that gray on the palette and then went back to dry brushing. And that gave me more of what I wanted, color. I like color. I like contrast. I don't like realism. I like seeing color being used. And then real quick in my airbrush, I put in a sickly yellowish brown and highlighted the surface of all those bubbles, which again are very smooth because I did that little wash of them while the sculpted mold was still wet. And as the module describes, the walls also get that treatment with the phosphorescent algae. Attaching the discs was pretty easy. Here's how I did it. A bit of hot glue on the washer underneath. That's metal, so it's going to cool very quickly. So I set it quickly. And that little recession, the hole in the middle of the washer, is a good place for the hot glue to seep in. You get lots of surface area, and these are very strong. So here it is, going into that keyed entry. Perfect, and it's very strong. I knock on it with the weight of my hand, and it's, it's staying there. Awesome. I'm going to save the big overview of this finished room for the end of the video. For now, let's move on. Room 8, Coffin. The door opens into an area of utter blackness, which is magical, but really this is the lair of a vampire named K Ketenmir. Stenmir. 
Chenmir? Kuth. I don't know how to pronounce that. But he's compelled by a curse to remain here in a trance, except when roused to defend his treasure. All right, so it's a dark room with a coffin and a vampire. Could have, could have just said that. Could have just said it. The body of the coffin is food box cardstock that I pre-measured out lengths and then lightly scored halfway through so that they'll fold very neatly and at predictable points. I cut out that strip, did the bending, and hot glued in a slab of foam board to help it keep its shape. Then I traced it onto dollar store foam board and cut it out with, I don't know, three or four millimeters outside of that tracing, so it's a little bigger. I did that twice, peeled off the paper, usual aluminum foil ball for texturing, and then glue it all together. I wish I were more creative and could come up with something for the lid, but I really couldn't, so I just sort of carved in a perimeter and maybe something will come to me later on. But then the whole thing gets the podge. Yep, healthy coat of Mod Podge. Then black, then dry brush gray. While that was drying, I took a wooden dowel and slathered it with this antique gold color. Very nice. And then I chopped short lengths to glue in between the lower and upper lids. Now to cut a wood dowel like this, you can use your crafting knife, your Olfa knife. Roll it as you cut. Don't try and just press down, don't try and saw. Roll it using the blade a few times back and forth and it will chop very cleanly. Then those are just fixed in place with a little bit of white glue. And that's looking pretty good. Mm. Uh. Yeah, we're gonna do it. This needs a happy little gem. I'll just glue that in the top. Hey, maybe this thing is magical. Maybe this is what's keeping the curse on him to keep him in the trance. There, I justified it. You know, I've been buying a lot of STLs lately for my 3D resin printer. It's sort of becoming a problem. But one of them is this awesome vampire. I will probably print a second one for my general collection, since this one needs to live in the box with this dungeon. As we take a couple minutes to survey what we've built today, let's read a little more about White Plume Mountain. It is an almost perfectly conical volcanic hill formed from an ancient slow lava leakage. It is about 1,000 yards in diameter at the base and rises about 800 feet above the surrounding land. The white plume which gives the mountain its name and fame is a continuous geyser that spouts from the very summit of the mountain another 300 feet into the air, trailing off to the east under the prevailing winds like a great white feather. The spray collects in depressions downslope and merges into a sizable stream. There are steam vents in various spots on the slopes of the mountain, but none of them are large enough to allow entry. The only possible entrance into the cone is a cave on the south slope known as the Wizard's Mouth. This cave actually seems to breathe, exhaling a large cloud of steam and then slowly inhaling like a man breathing on a cold day. Each cycle takes about 30 seconds. Approaching the cave, the party will hear a whistling noise coinciding with the wind cycle. If it were not for the continuous roaring of the plume, this whistling could be heard for a great distance. The cave is about 8 feet in diameter and 40 feet long, and at the end, near the roof, is a long horizontal crevice which is about a foot wide. The air is sucked into this crack at great speed, creating the loud whistling and snuffing out torches. Shortly, the rush of air slows down, stops for about two seconds, and then comes back out in a great blast of steam. This steam is not hot enough to scald anyone who keeps low and avoids the crevice, but it does make the cave very uncomfortable, like a very hot sauna bath interrupted by blasts of cold air. The ceiling and walls of the cave are slick with the condensed steam which runs down them. The floor is covered with several inches of fine muck. Only careful probing of the muck near the back of the cave reveals a small square trap door with a rusted iron ring set in it. I wonder if I should back up and model that in the next episode. I didn't talk about the entrance. Anyway, once the muck is cleared away, it will require at least three characters with a lot of strength to pull up the encrusted door. Directly beneath is the 20-foot square vertical shaft with the spiral staircase leading down to room one. Coming together nicely, that whole first branch of the dungeon is done. Two more to go. If this is the first video of mine you've discovered, I have a whole backlog of videos like this. And come find us on the Tabletop Crafters Guild on Facebook. Almost 40,000 members. Until next time, I'm Wylock. Make things and play games.
Hello everyone, Wylock here. Thanks for joining me today. We are back at it, going back into White Plume Mountain. This is part three of our build. You know, in this hobby, it seems that revelations and breakthroughs tend to happen completely out of the blue. You never know when you're going to be gifted with an awesome result. One of the rooms we're going to do today ended up being... It's jumped to the top of my personal list as the favorite work that I've ever done. The terrain is of fairly little mechanical consequence. The players won't spend much time there, but put a lot into it and it ended up looking really awesome. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. Now, before we go any further, I have a problem. The doors are cleaving away at the walls. In hindsight, this makes sense. The doors are made of popsicle sticks, which are totally rigid. They have no give. And the walls are a little thicker than usual with that tin foil wrinkle protruding out. So I threw away all the doors that I made. And hey, while we're at it, let me tell you how I made the doors because I think I forgot to. <laughs> I used popsicle sticks and cut them into two inch lengths. So you can get two two inch pieces out of a popsicle stick. Therefore, we're gonna get three popsicle sticks for one door. The middle of the clip-on is, as usual, double corrugated cardboard because it's the same thickness of the wall, or nearly so. So to create that spacer, I just took some thin cardstock, cut a matching piece, and hot glued it on. And the squeezed out hot glue plus that piece gives a little bit of extra width to the clip-on, and it's going to introduce that give so that the doors don't cleave away at the walls anymore. Corrugation gets clad with cereal box cardstock, as usual. And then I took some thin cardstock and with white glue put on some banding, just a little bit from the top and the bottom. I don't put on door poles or door knobs because I don't have the patience. I paint them up. Uh, I recently covered this in my blinged in stone video, but in case you didn't see that one, this color is called asphaltum. It's an orangey brown, watering it down a lot and staining the wood with it, and then going to Agrax Earthshade or a dark brown paint watering it down and going over the dried asphaltum color creates a wonderfully deep, rich, complex wood color. Gorgeous. From there, easy enough, just gunmetal on the banding and black on the cladding. Clips onto the door very easily now. Still holds, but doesn't tear at the wall. Problem solved. Room 9, Pool and Drain. As the characters move along the water-covered corridor, they can see that the water is deeper in a small circular area to the east. This is actually a 10-foot deep pit. So this is not revolutionary. This is made exactly the same way as all the other hallways and rooms. The only difference is I took some watered-down black paint, it's really just a wash, and darkened that pit. From the text, it seems that it is apparent to the party, so I don't think this gives away anything. Room 10, deceptively deep room. Ahead is what appears to be a water-covered room with steps rising out of the muck on the far side. Most of the area is actually a 15-foot deep pool. The only shallow spaces is that perimeter that's shown on the map that runs around the room. Now this is a big room. It feels kind of wasteful because really it just comes down to a combat with two Kelpies. But I'm here, I'm doing this. Let's not compromise. At least let's not compromise today. We'll see how I feel tomorrow. Now I did have an internal debate raging whether I should sort of hint at those walkways that are a foot deep versus the rest of the room. Should I let the terrain give meta knowledge to the players? Ideally, you would say, uh, no, of course not. But seeing as how this is mostly going to be a display piece and it's otherwise just an enormous square room, I did end up taking that black wash and darkening everything down except for where the elevated paths are just under the surface of the water. Just for show. That's fine. Who cares? Whatever. We're here to compromise. Also in room 10, in the eastern wing of the pool are two partly enclosed areas with entrances that are only accessible from beneath the surface of the water. So they're underwater rooms, so I poured their resin a bit deeper to kind of show that. The southern chamber is the Kelpie's lair and it contains their treasure. The treasure is 2,000 gold pieces, a suit of plus one chainmail armor, and a piece of jewelry. That's quite specific, so I have to craft that. Chipboard base for the scatter. Hot glue to give it some bulk. Got this old miniature from my drawer. I don't remember where it's from or what brand it is. I know it's flimsy and the detail is poor, but I'm gonna chop off the head and some other bits. Actually, everything that wouldn't just be like a suit of armor laying there. Also from my costume bits bin, 
I just found a little thing that would represent a piece of jewelry. Hot glue all of that down and flock with gold glitter. And there, I have rendered what's in the text. Nice. Room 11, spinning cylinder. The stone corridor changes abruptly to a spinning cylinder apparently made of some light colored metal. The inner surface rotates rapidly. It is painted in a dizzying black and white spiral pattern and it glistens as if coated with some substance. That is oil, it's part of a trap. We'll come back to that later. But for now, we will go to the closet door and to the inside of the closet door where hang my collected treasures over the past few months. Yes, here we go. This one will do nicely. I process this thing down, cut it in half, cut it to length, dry fit it, make sure it's going to work. And then I prep the hallway in the usual manner before gluing this down. It's just going to make it easier to get that tin foil in and do all that beforehand. The half pipe is just attached with a healthy bead of hot glue. It's much stronger than it looks. So everything is based in black and the hallway gets painted up. The tube gets left as black and then with some light painter's tape, I put on the spiral and airbrush on some very, 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 very light gray, not white. I'm trying to get out of the habit of using pure white in projects. It, it just doesn't look good. Room 12, Burkett's Guard Post. Watching through an arrow slit at the end of the passage is an alert guard named Burkett, just a human veteran. If he sees intruders approaching, he will wait until they're halfway down the spinning cylinder, then ignite the slippery oil with flaming arrows. Also, this room has a couple benches and a table, upon which is a large candlestick and Snarla's spellbook. More on Snarla in a moment. Table's easy, just a couple of craft wood products, you really can't go wrong. Bash them together, and then I painted them exactly as I described for the doors earlier. That's my new wood kit, if you will. Candle, as usual, DM Scotty candles, love it. Take a toothpick, put hot glue on everything but the last two or three millimeters, and then paint that up. The spell book on the table. Chipboard, two tiny rectangles, and then a rectangle of food box cardstock, which is a much thinner type of cardstock. Glue those on, paint them up. Spellbook. And maybe the candle's been used a while and the wax has run down onto the table or it's starting to drip off the table. Yeah, little features like that. Cool, it's not the most complex trap in the world, but it has a human component to it, which is a little uncommon. I like it, there's a lot of flavor over here. It doesn't make a lick of sense to me, but it doesn't have to. It's a funhouse dungeon. There's Burkett. Room 13, Snarla's Sanctum. Unlike the room you just left, this place is beautifully decorated. The floor is covered by fine rugs. The wall is covered by exotic tapestries and shimmering curtains. The ceiling is an intricate mosaic. In the northeast corner, there's a large and lavishly colored bed, and next to it is a low table with a buffet of sweetmeats, cakes, and other delicious looking treats. And in the northwest corner of the room, there's a brass bound oak chest. Okay, that's a lot of specificity, which I like. This room, as it says, is unlike the rest in the dungeon. Let's play around with some colors. I clad up all the corrugation and made this very smooth and then based it with a khaki spray primer. Then kitchen sponging on some, this is called dark brown. I don't think it's dark brown at all. It's more of sort of a maple color, but that's what's on the bottle. Anyway, sponging that on and then using a brush to get into those nooks and crannies in the corner so it's a nice uniform speckling. Then this gets the usual black wash, 10 parts water to one part black acrylic craft paint. Dries in about 15 minutes. While it is drying, I started on that quote, lavish bed. So I'm using foam board here because it doesn't absorb moisture very much. Peeling the paper off of both sides and then taking some toilet paper or any sort of tissue paper, wrapping it around and wetting it down with a mixture of white glue and water or Mod Podge. I don't know, any kind of adhesive should work. And if, as you're setting it in place, it starts to clump up and tear and look bad, just take another dry sheet of tissue paper, wrap it around. It'll quickly absorb and settle right in. Gave that overnight to dry and painted it up. In this case, purple. So base coat with a dark purple and dry brush with a lavender. 
Now I prepped a whole bunch of craft sticks with that wood paint technique again that I covered earlier and cut them to length and I hot glued on a bed frame to the mattress. Then, wooden dowels, one at each corner to make a cool four post bed, attached on the underside with hot glue so that it stays out of sight. Or, be a real hobbyist and use a better glue. I'm not that patient. This is a cool teardrop shaped piece of wood that I found in my drawer. I'm gonna cut this down and have it serve as a headboard. No headboard is complete without dat be jeweling. Oh yeah, so to the costume jewelry bin and find some embellishment for the headboard. You can also see I've put some planks along the top to connect the four posts together at the top. Drapes, or curtains, wh whatever. This is just plain white printer paper, and if you scrunch it up and unscrunch it, and re-scrunch it and unscrunch it, and do that a whole bunch of times, it sort of starts to feel a little bit like fabric, and it becomes pretty easy to work with. So if you cut out a, I'd say a classical shield shape like this and fold it in half, then when it attaches to the bedpost, it's going to look like bunched up drapes. So I gave those a couple of coats with a fuchsia color here, and it's on a silicone mat because nothing sticks to silicone. It's my Sherbonder silicone mat. And while that's drying, I thought about how to do pillows, and it came to me that I was overthinking it. Just a little bit of foam board with the paper peeled off both sides, cut some tiny rectangles, and then push at them and sort of break down the corners and soften them up. Don't even need to paint them. They're the right color and everything. Glue them onto the mattress. Pillows. Done. With the drapes dry, I did use some white glue to attach these. For reinforcement, they got glued along the post and along the top of that frame, and then I folded them over just a little bit to hang off of the top of that frame. And finally, to cap it off and hide that ugliness on top, more craft sticks painted in the same way, mitered 45 degrees, and glued along the top of this four-post bed. Let's get a close-up look of it. Now, if you were fully reading the module, you know by now who Snarla is, but Burkett and Snarla are lovers, and she is actually a werewolf, so that's a whole thing. And I guess they live here in this dungeon, just sort of hanging out and doing uh, minor illusion and chill, if you will. Now, let's talk about that low table with the sweet meats and cakes. By the way, sweet meats means candy. It's not actually meat that is sweet. I had to Google that. Anyway, I got my standard hole punch, and I got this little one millimeter hole punch, punching out a whole bunch of chipboard. Nice graphics medium chipboard, it's like one and a half millimeters thick. For the cakes, I'm going to glue some of the larger ones together with white glue, a stack of three. And then I have this googly eye, it's a big oval, that's all I really care about. It's a good serving platter, so I glue on some of the tiny punch outs to that. This will be the candy. Now I was messing around with potions and paint colors, like maybe they're really elaborate exotic cakes with it, whatever, it's not worth talking about. It looks terrible. So I put that aside and I went to the rugs. I used Google image search and did my usual trick, compiling them in Photoshop and printing them and gluing them to food box cardstock. Turns out Snarla shops at Wayfair. But with these cut out, I can glue them in place in a scattered manner to make it look sort of like a like a harem or, you know, give it that Baldur's Gate sort of aesthetic. I don't know. Let's just play around with these. So those are done, let's dry fit the bed, and the table is looking, uh, let's go to something else. The tapestries, the exotic tapestries on the wall. Once again, Google image search, cut these out, and then wrap them around a toothpick that I've already painted in gold. A Little bit of glue stick to attach them together, and then glue that to a clip-on which is painted up exactly like the walls. Shazam, exotic tapestries. All right, it's time to confront this problem. Uh, the cakes don't look good. I'm not gonna do them that way. Instead, for the candies, I'm gonna paint those up with not dark colors, but also not fluorescent colors. Something that looks a little more tied in with the medieval setting. For the cakes, I have a honey brown and a like a standard brown, a chocolate brown. So the side of the cake got painted with chocolate brown. Then I glued them on along with the tray of candies. 
And then I'm going to that honey brown color and painting the tops of the cakes with that. Two or three coats and putting it on real thick. I'm not worried about texture. Actually, that would be preferable. Then I've got red paint. This is actually Vallejo. It's a nice model paint, but cheap acrylics should work too. And a nice healthy dollop right in the middle. Bam. Yes. Yes. Those look like tiny miniature cakes to scale. I love it. This table is my favorite thing that I've ever done. And once again, I just thank the stars that I met a woman early in life. Moving on to the chest. With cereal box cardstock, I lightly score across it every couple millimeters, and then they crack and bend quite easily, and you could form them around the end of a popsicle stick. Using hot glue on the inside so it doesn't show, and then just painting it up and attaching some costume jewelry as a padlock. Boom. Chest. Now let's put this room together. Here's the room, here's the bed, a couple of clip-ons, the low table with the delicacies, and the chest in the corner, just like the module says. And here's Snarla in her humanoid form. I'm getting sick of talking and you're getting sick of listening to me, so I'm going to be quiet for a minute and just let these shots pan around. Enjoy. I'll be back in a moment. And so let's look where we are overall in the dungeon. Tonight we've gone into the middle prong of the dungeon, if you will. Here's room nine with that deep pit. Here is room 10 with the two Kelpies waiting. Those are sort of bizarre creatures. I had a hard time finding good miniatures for those. These were printed with my Anycubic Photon Mono. And here's the two underwater rooms, including the one with, you know, as I'm recording this, I'm realizing I probably could have and should have put the treasure in there and then poured the resin. Might have looked better. That's okay. Here's our party in the hallway and Burkett is about to light up their world. Love it. Burkett himself, also 3D printed. That's a one page rules miniature. Good stuff. Love them. Here's the table with the spell book and candle. Came out pretty good. I mean, it looks rough in this shot, but remember I am zoomed in all the way with my DSLR here going to reveal every sin at the microscopic level. And there's Snarla's room. We took a look at that earlier, so I won't harp on that. But here is the miniature I prepared for if and when she transforms into a werewolf. So there it is. We are cruising through White Plume Mountain. I must say, I'm having a lot more fun building this one than I did with Tomb of Horrors. I'll, uh, indescribably so. Not only are the construction methods for this aesthetic easier, but I've been working very efficiently. It's just something in the air. It's going really well. Can't explain it. Thank you very much for watching today. In the off chance that you're new around here, be sure to find us on the Tabletop Crafters Guild on Facebook. Almost 40,000 members doing this kind of thing, making miniature tabletop terrain for their role-playing games. Till next time, I am Wylock. Make things, play games. Today, I am going to pull off a stunt that I guarantee no other YouTube miniature hobbyist has ever done. I will also attempt by far my most massive resin pour ever and continue to cleave my way through White Plume Mountain. Stick the F around. Hello everyone, Wylock here, welcome back, and I am psyched to be back at this project. Not a lot of rooms quantity-wise today, but 
a lot of interesting developments in them as I built them, so let me regale you with the tale of part four of my complete and unabridged construction of White Plume Mountain. All right, we gotta knock out some tedium here before we get to the fun stuff. Area 14, flood doors. The three doors along the corridor are made of thick metal, their edges flanged so that they overlap the door jamb on the north side and thus can only be opened by pivoting them to the north. The north side of each door has a handle, and these barriers are emergency doors. Their purpose is to prevent the dungeon from being flooded by the boiling lake in Area 15 in case of an accident. For all the nonsense in this dungeon, this is a pretty logical idea. I like it. These doors, like all, will be clip-ons, but they will be made in two pieces. Notice the single corrugated cardboard. Yes. A small half and a large half are made, and then they are joined together. And this creates that flanged feature that the text talks about. So you imagine if you're on the smaller side, you can push it open to the north, and if you're on the north side, you can pull it back with the handle. It's a check valve. So if the boiling lake that we're about to discuss backflows, these three check valves prevent the entire dungeon from being flooded. Good to know. Ominous, but good to know. Area 15, Boiling Lake. This boiling lake is several hundred feet deep. You know what? This is easier to just draw out for you. So it's a massive underground cave, several hundred feet deep. It's filled with water. It's an underground lake. At the very bottom of the cave is exposed magma, red hot rock. The water pretty much reaches the ceiling of this cavern, and 50 feet below the surface of the water is a sunken stone ledge that protrudes out. On that stone ledge is a magical half egg shaped bubble, but we'll cover that in the next entry. Water flows in through a tunnel in an underground stream about 100 feet below the level of the ledge. The water in the lake gets heated and boiled by the red hot magma at the bottom, and escapes as steam through a chimney in the far side of the cavern. This is Area 16. The steam going up that chimney goes all the way up to the top of the volcanic cone, giving White Plume Mountain its namesake. This is it right here. But do keep in mind, all of the water in this lake is at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, or 100 degrees Celsius, at all times. Area 17, The Boiling Bubble. A sunken stone ledge, which we drew earlier, projects out into the boiling lake. The corridor from the dungeon goes out into a domed area under a magical force field that keeps out the water by forming a sort of elastic skin. The shape of it is not square in cross-section, but semicircular, as if a series of hoops were supporting the ceiling. The corridor gives way to an oval-shaped domed area enclosed by the protective skin. Here lives the Guardian of the Treasure, a huge, giant crab that has the following changes to its stats to increase its challenge rating. On one of its claws, it wears a rune-covered copper band that makes it immune to being charmed, frightened, and paralyzed. So this is a huge, giant crab that seems to really value treasure. Huh. Why is this ringing a bell? Also at the north end of the domed area is a heavy chest firmly attached to the floor, and in it is Wave, the sentient trident one of the three treasures that we're here for. Right on, let's get to it. This is gonna be a big tile, not as big as in the map. I know that I started this project under the guise of being no compromise, and since then I've done nothing but compromise, but really, this does not need to be as big as it's in the map. It's never gonna fit in my storage bin if I do that. So, starting with double corrugated, I'm gonna sketch out the oval here. If you don't know how to draw an oval, you can take two points, connect them with a string, and then just let your marker ride along it like you see here. That's how you draw an oval. The distance between those two points and the length of the string allow you to change the size and ovality of the oval, just FYI. And I'm sketching out where the underground stream comes in and where the blowhole will be. Attaching walls as usual, three quarter inch tall, hot glue, double corrugated cardboard, all the classics slathering with a good coat of white glue, and then installing my protruding stone platform, which is just more cut out double corrugated cardboard, with some graphics medium chipboard attached on top for smoothness and rigidity. The rest of it gets flocked with my mix of fine sand. It's a construction sand, so it's got some mixed aggregate to it. Texturing the walls, my age old trick for caverns and caves, draw a bead of hot glue across that corner where the floor meets the wall, and then tease it upward with the nozzle of the hot glue gun. Always upward. Gives the illusion of stalagmites. And I do that on the outside as well. Now as expected, we've got some massive warping. Totally expected. 
I flip it over, I paint on a healthy layer of white PVA glue, and let it sit for 24 hours. Not for 3 hours, which is when it will feel dry and you'll think it's done. No, you gotta wait a true 24 hours. And when you do this trick, if you happen to bias a little bit thicker glue toward the edges, eh, that'll help. That's the part that's curled up anyway. Here it is all fixed up, flat as a board, dry as a bone. I'll begin by painting the lava. I've got a plain old orange here, and a plain old red, though really you'll only need the orange. I'm going back to the water cup pretty frequently here to keep my brush full of water, and then directly to the paint, and then directly to the piece. This way, when it strikes the piece, the water and the paint mix, and you can see, in the video here, you can see the capillary action of the sand sucking in all of that orange paint. Frequent trips back to the water jar when painting sand. The walls, on the other hand, get a solid, solid thick coat of black acrylic craft paint with a dry brush heavily loaded with black paint because I don't have the patience to do another coat. In hindsight, probably could have just spray primed the whole thing black and then painted the orange, but, uh, but I didn't. Also based the stone platform with a nice neutral gray and moving on to finish the lava. Very simple, dry brushing with black. Fairly little black paint on the bristles of the brush and not using a whole lot of pressure, so it only catches the high detail of all that sand. And man, for the effort involved, that's some pretty good looking lava, or magma. Magma. Liquid hot magma. Since I already had the black out, I watered it down and washed the stone platform, but it was a little bit rich, a little bit too dark. So I went back after it was dry and sponged on some more light gray. Looks like nucleate boiling anyway, which is what we've got going on in this room. And it only took like eight seconds to do that, so let me do that. I'll be back in eight seconds. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. Okay, the walls are finished up just like all the other tiles in the entire dungeon. I use that same gray and then the barn wood color, dry brushing them consecutively. Easy. As I tell you about the next step, I need to first tell you about something marvelous that has happened. After six years hawking their products, generating revenue untold, and generally championing that mana from heaven graphics medium chipboard, I have been in contact with and partnered up with Graphics Arts. That's right. And among all these cool samples they sent me, one of them is plastic film. Yes, or more accurately stated, craft plastic. The stuff is like, I don't know, half a millimeter thick? It's fairly rigid, and it comes with a protective film on both sides. Once you peel it off, it is perfectly clear and see-through. So I simply cut strips of it half inch wide, put in this cardboard form, and held the plastic strip against it as I hot glued the strip down on the outside of the egg only. This bead of hot glue will be subsumed in resin later on, so I'm not too worried about it aesthetically. And if anything, it looks like the raging tides of the boiling water against the skin on the outside anyways. Whatever. Yeah, that's effective. Then it was time to pour. Everything outside the bubble, including on some of the stone ledge, is boiling water. So I'm going to use clear resin. This is Art & Glow. It's in my recommended supplies in the description below. You mix it 50-50, then you stir it very thoroughly. Then you have 40 minutes to get it poured. Little pricey, but awesome stuff, and very reliable, and crystal clear as you'll see in a moment. Usually I'm tinting these with some acrylic ink for some reason or another, but for this boiling water and this underground spring, no, it's gonna be perfectly clear. These Starbucks cups are great. They have lines already on them. So with two of them, I could be sure that I was getting exactly a 50-50 mix of the resin and the hardener. Here we go. Ah, yes. Once you get underway, it's not so daunting. If you've never done a resin pour before, I was doing a live stream the other night and someone said they didn't have the guts for resin. I said, neither did I, and I still don't, but you can do it. Look, if I can do it, you can do it. Pour from a bit of a height to try and remove bubbles. Also, don't stir so aggressively like I did, or you'll froth the mixture and get those bubbles in the first place. That is why I have so many bubbles. But they eventually rise to the top and you can burn them away with the flick of a lighter or hot air from a hair dryer. Say that three times fast. 18 hours later, fully cured, glossy to the touch, not sticky at all, beautiful. 
Also, this thing weighs like three damn pounds. This is the heaviest tile I have ever made. That is a legit half to five eighth inch thick resin pour over a pretty wide area. And I think it perfectly represents that boiling lake that's being repelled by this magical clear elastic skin. Now that chest, I've also stopped overthinking chests. I take a large jumbo sized popsicle stick, cut off the ends, and I've got some cereal box, wrap that around and attach with hot glue. Slather that with a watered down brown paint, wrap a thin bit of cardstock around it with some white glue, and paint that banding with gunmetal, then glue on some bauble to serve as the padlock or the latch or whatever. And voila, five minute chest. And since this thing is permanently attached, I'm gonna go ahead and hot glue it on the tile. Yes, let's get a glamour shot of this little chest. Now coming up is its guardian, the crab. All right, buckle up because we need to talk about the crab. The model itself is 3D printed. I bought it on my mini factory and then printed it up on my Anycubic Photon. Printed resin models look great, but then once you spray prime them with gray, so much detail is instantly revealed and you realize they look even better than you thought. This is a huge miniature, but I decided to eschew a base. Yes, I use the word eschew. Now I printed this several months ago, not knowing exactly what I was gonna do with it, but figuring it's a crab, it'll probably be red. So I'm gonna base coat it in red while I have my airbrush out for whatever other project I was doing. Then, just a few days before editing this video, on a whim, I decided to do a live stream painting the crab. If you really want to, you can go watch that live stream, but in short, I painted it with an airbrush, then covered the carapace with white glue and flocked with gold glitter. And if you didn't get that reference a few minutes ago, I had a little fun with this model and took inspiration from Tamatoa from Disney's Moana. So that glittery gold carapace was looking great, but I still felt that it was missing something. Now, apparently, some of you have pointed out with varying levels of disgust that over the years I may have on occasion indulged in the use of some crafting gemstones in a arbitrary and perhaps tacky manner. Now I accept and recognize all criticism, constructive or otherwise, but I personally don't think this is that pervasive of a problem. These are Swarovski crystals. Some random gems. More bits, gems and beads and stuff. Place some gemstones in the glue. But then I also hot glued on some of those flat back crafting gemstones. Stuck on some gems. And for the eyes I used flat back rhinestones. And then a couple more gemstones along the frame. Glued in some flat back gemstones to the eyes. That said, I did go ahead and be them. Some costume jewelry from my random box. This needs a happy little gem. Two millimeter flat back gemstones and some Swarovski crystals. So I covered those with red plastic gemstones. Quick little crafting crystal. I'm gonna bejewel the hell out of this thing. Okay, well it seems I have two options here. Buckle or lean in. Actually that's wrong. There are two options, but the options are lean in or lean in hard. So lean in hard is what I have done. A few years back, my wife's wedding ring had a few of its diamonds found to be damaged. So they were replaced, but I asked to hold on to the old ones because they had minor chips in them and no one else was gonna use them. Held on to them in the safety box for several years and realized this is the opportunity. I'm going to bejewel my craft with real diamonds. Here is one of the two. They are both genuine 0.3 carat round brilliant cut VS1 class F diamonds. To mount them, very simply, a graduated approach with a series of pin vise drills, a blob of white PVA glue because it will wash off if I ever want to unmount these, and then setting them in the shell. I just wanted to show you something painted this last night. Uh -huh. Sort of, it's a huge crab in the adventure, but I figured I'd paint it like Tamatoa and I like it. yeah, let's glitter it up. Do you like the carapace? Shiny. shiny. Do you like the carapace? That's the part on the back. Yes, I yeah. do. Do you recognize those? Are those from my ring? Yes. So this is real diamonds on it. Yes. <laughs> Love you. I love you too. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, and one last thing that circlet that's on its forearm, protecting it from spells. 
I went to my usual costume jewelry drawer looking for something that would fit. The only thing that really did doesn't look copper, like the text says, but I don't care. It really matches his color scheme and it looks great. So I took this and super glued it on. Artistic license. This has been happening to me a lot lately. Benign elements of projects are just coming out very special for some reason. And then the things I'm excited about that I put a lot of energy into kind of fall flat. I don't know. I don't know. I will say the flash live streams I've been doing lately have been helpful for my productivity. I feel weird sitting there in an awkward silence thinking and strategizing. So I am compelled to always be in motion, always doing something. And that is the reason that I got this crab done. Like I said, it's been sitting on the shelf base coated in red for months. And then on a whim over the course of 90 minutes, got it done because I had to. Uh, the rest of the video is downhill from here. I'll just be honest. You can jump ahead to the dungeon fly throughs if you want to. Oh, we're going to do a few more rooms, but uh, none of them are as exciting. Before I do that, let's just take a little breather here. Let's just revisit the basic tile construction for this dungeon. I usually avoid wet work and wet blending because I like to move fast, so I tend to overbrush and dry brush, but the complexity and the undertones you can get by being patient and doing a lot of wet work like this, uh, you just can't simulate it. And there's a sliding door 10 feet away from my desk to the outside. I put them out there under the sun and everything is dry in about 20 minutes. Oh, on one of these tiles, I tried a different dry brushing technique. Let me show you. First, I did the walls as usual, but then I went to the floor and started to dry brush it with the usual barn wood color. And, and then here's what's different. I realized I forgot to flock the floor. So I had to re-white glue this, pull down the sand, redo that, wait for it to dry, rebase coat with black, rebase coat with brown. But thanks to the breezy outside, that only took about an hour and a half. Then I was back on track and dry brushing again. Beautiful. Room 18, Hall Pit. Halfway down the corridor is a 10 foot deep pit hidden under the water. I'm not modeling that. Room 19, Metal Heating Corridor. A series of copper colored metal plates lines the walls of the path before you. This is a trap. These plates produce an invisible electric field, and the further down the hallway you go, the more all of the metal upon your person becomes heated. I love it. These are very simple clip-ons. Easy as it gets. 14 of them, then base coated with a metallic copper. It's labeled copper, but it looks more like gold to me. And then I took another type of copper and just airbrushed some gradients at a slant on all the surfaces. This wasn't for any particular reason other than to give some color variation, make them a little more interesting. And I thought about doing a pale green verdigris, verdigris? I don't know how to pronounce that. Maybe I'll add it later, but not for now. I do think in the last or second to last video of this series, I'll probably go back and do a touch-ups of the entire dungeon. You know, things I wish I had done differently. Anyways, there we go. 14 copper plate clip-ons. Room 20, Ghoul Ambushers. Behind the secret door, eight ghouls wait in ambush for intruders to come through the heat induction corridor. Seemingly pedestrian, but when you consider the fact that they've probably just sprinted through that hallway, out of breath, disoriented, and superheated, throwing anything at them at that point is going to be challenging. These two are 3D printed models. I bought them on my mini factory. And I finally have an opportunity to use this necrotic flash color from Army Painter that's been sitting on my shelf for like five years. First, I base coated with Army Green and then a top-down zenithal highlight with the necrotic flesh color. All oh, the airbrush is so powerful. Cannot recommend it strongly enough. It will change your hobby life more than any other tool. Look at this, with a light dusting from top-down only, all the shadows naturally and immediately pop out. So satisfying. Let's do another one. Yes, watch the face. Watch the face as it suddenly comes into view. No need to wash. Oh man, love it. Let's do one more. And of course you could, and I have, washed after doing a zenithal highlight, but if you do that, you want to make sure to have a real strong contrast, more so than you see here. You want the two colors to be further apart because the wash really will damp down the brighter color. So if you want that contrast and shadows to shine through a wash, make sure the two colors are far apart. After that, it's back to conventional brush. I'll just throw a beige on their tattered cloaks, gunmetal on their shackles, 
washing those down with Agrax Earthshade, and not a wet brush. I'm using some pretty rich Agrax here. I'm counting on tide marks and staining to dull this down. And while that's drying, I did up the base. I like to do all my D&D miniatures with the same color base. Base coat with black, dry brush with Americana Slate Gray. I don't mind that they look different than the environment that they're in, as long as all the bases are the same, and black and gray is neutral enough to me. So there you have it. It took about 15 minutes to paint all eight of these. That is the power of the airbrush. I'm perfectly happy with the quality considering this is a one-off project and these will probably never be used. Room 22, Frictionless Trap. The path to the west is broken by a sizable gap and you can see the glint of metal at the bottom of the opening. The floor beyond this area has a silvery sheen. In the distance you can see another hole, beyond which is another patch of floor that adjoins the western wall. These openings are pits, and the bottoms are lined with rusty razor-like blades. Anyone who falls on them takes damage and might contract a disease called Super Tetanus. As for the silvery area, the walls, ceiling, and floor are covered with a substance that is completely frictionless. You know what's great about double corrugated cardboard? You can cleave off the top layer and create the illusion of depth in your 2.5D tile. So that's what I did for the pits. Then it was a matter of what do I use to represent the razors? So I went to my various junk bins and found the dollar store hair curlers. I forget how many times I've used these to represent things, but the inner cylinder, take that out, spray prime it with gray, paint it up with some shimmering silver. This Americana shimmering silver is my favorite silver. Every paint manufacturer seems to have one color that they're really good at. So like my collection has eight or nine brands in it, but it's because I want the ones with the best coverage. And this is plastic, so it cuts pretty easily with kitchen scissors. And I get a row of just sort of gnarly looking, I don't know, spikes or razor blades or something. It'll work. Just to experiment and play around with more of these Vallejo texture paints, I've got this thick Russian mud. I'm gonna fill the pit with that and use that as sort of a glue. Lay in these silver painted rows of razor blades, work them into the muck, and then sort of cover them up a little bit just to pin them down in a few places. And once that's dry, more Vallejo environmental effects. This is their rust texture. Some random dabbing all over the pit. Tie it all together, mucky it up. And I didn't film it, but the silvery area is very simply some cereal box, scored and folded and glued in place, then painted with that Americana shimmering silver. Done and done. And now let's have an overview of everything that I've built today. As I fly over everything, let me read to you a little more from entry 17 in the text. It has to do with the treasure in the domed area. Wave, the sentient trident, can be activated and cast a cube of force. It will instantly make the bearer aware of this property and allow the bearer to instantly become attuned to it if that person worships a god of the sea or is willing to convert on the spot. Characters protected by the cube will probably end up being blown out the geyser at the top of the mountain. The air-filled cube will float, drain down the cascade, and be ejected from the plume, a very rocky ride. Characters could also survive the boiling lake, if the skin is pierced, with a combination of immunity to fire damage and the ability to breathe water. I'm realizing that this dungeon isn't as large as Tomb of Horrors, not by a long shot. Progress is pretty smooth. I bet there's probably only two, maybe one episode left. I'll have to see how much I get done. We all know the big room that's coming up. 26 is going to take some time. Also in room 22, the frictionless trap, I didn't address the illusory wall on the far west side of the room. Having it there would give away meta knowledge to the players at the table that something is going on. Although, it might be useful in the future to build something that can be inserted once they realize what's going on. Oh, or what I should have done is made the overall tile smaller and then another two by one section to add on once they've realized that it's an illusionary wall. Ah. Again, that's something for the punch list in the cleanup episode. Hey, crafting for your tabletop gaming is fun, and you should do it. If you're new around here, I have a large back catalog of videos to watch, including a full build of the Tomb of Horrors, and be sure to find us on Facebook, the Tabletop Crafters Guild. Almost 40,000 members building cool stuff for their miniature tabletop role-playing games. Thanks for watching today. Until next time, I am Wylock. Make things, play games.
Welcome back. Good to see you. It is one of the most iconic rooms in the history of published Dungeons & Dragons products. And today we shall build it as we march toward the finish of our complete 2.5D build of White Plume Mountain. That's right, we're jumping out of order. I know this is what you all came here for anyway, so we're going to go ahead and do the inverted ziggurat room. In this way, the few rooms we're skipping, which really don't have much to speak to anyway, I'll bundle those in with the final episode that accompanies the grand setup and walkthrough. Or to put that in other words, I've been away for several months and I want to get a video out and this is all I have built. Yeah, so here it is, room 26, the terraced aquarium. You are looking out and down into an enormous chamber defined by terraced steps that ring the entire area and descend toward a central enclosure. Water laps at the edge of the stone floor. Looking to the side, you can see the ring of the terrace that lies beyond is a 10-foot ring of water held by a nearly transparent wall. And there's two more steps, a dry one in the middle and more water in the third. And it gives a bunch of dimensions and some stats about the glass itself. The only exit from the room is the door that leads south out of the very bottom tier. And it talks about breaking the glass and what happens if you do, etc, etc, etc. Creatures. The occupants of each level will be randomly distributed. There are none on the top tier of the terrace. The aquarium inside that area has six giant crayfish. The dry one has six giant scorpions. And then the lowest aquarium holds four sea lions. On the very bottom tier are three wing-clipped manticores that are unable to fly. But they won't hesitate to fire their spikes at any target they recognize as an intruder. Also on the very bottom tier, set into the north wall, there's a safe. It's trapped. It's got a lot of treasure in it. Now, historically and traditionally, I have always been a cardboard man. Live and die by the fibers. But for the bulk of this project and the sheer amount of structure I need to fill in, and also for rigidity, I decided to use foam. Down comes the Proxen hot wire table. And I cut a bunch of blocks. Started with the two inch thick stuff and worked down from there. Good wholesome opportunity to teach the kids how to use some tools as well. It was a nice little Saturday. They cut up about 8,000 random little bits and then asked me to hot glue all of it to a broken down cardboard box to make like a Mario level. Here it is. Anyways, cutting, cutting, and cutting. Remember we are taking the 2.5D approach here. So the height is not to scale, it's not as described. Also I had to take into account storage. All of this is going in this Rubbermaid container, so I measured that container and determined I can do a 15 by 24 inch rectangle. That's cleanly divisible by 1.5. So yes, I am completely breaking with the book, but it's in the name of practicality and this'll be, it, it's fine. It's just fine. I know I built a YouTube channel and a reputation on saying it's not fine, but it, it really is fine. First, I thought to use toothpicks to help with strength, but don't do this. You can't align them correctly. I mean, I need these to line up exactly. So I just glue them together and hot glue is fine. Anyone who says that hot glue melts foam, just like squeeze a bunch of excess out of your glue onto some paper so that it cools down a bit and then use it right away. But even so, even on the hot setting, I've never had an issue with hot glue melting my foam. Yeah, building the terraces here, and I did mill down some half-inch thick strips out of my thicker stock to get the four terrace levels, half-inch intervals. Need something on the bottom for strength, and I'd been holding on to these back panels of some cheap furniture that we bought I don't know how long ago. It's not MDF, it's not hardboard, but it's not cardboard either. It, it's pretty sturdy, and it's just about the perfect size. So I tossed it down in front of my overexposed camera because I'm still figuring out the intensity of this halo light I built and scored and cut it to the size I wanted. Hot glued it to the bottom of the terraced assembly with the intent being rigidity and durability. As I said before, I'm gonna do inch and a half squares purely for aesthetics. It's really not for measuring anything. And yes, these large creatures technically can't fit because they're supposed to be on two inch bases, but I have recently taken to mounting my large creatures on 40 millimeter bases anyway. I know there's 2% of you out there that aren't gonna be able to sleep tonight. Just know that as you're tossing and turning, I empathize and I know that I've betrayed you. Going around the perimeter and laying down a thin bead of hot glue to sort of serve as a caulking. There's going to be a resin pour later on and this is just preparing for that. For texturing the bottommost layer, I went to the cereal box block trick. I first tried this out in the Mind Flayer layer last year, and I really love the technique. It's pretty easy, it's very gratifying. It's a zen thing as you glue on the bricks. 
And to quickly recap, you freehand cut some few millimeter wide strips of cereal box and then chop them into blocks of varying size. Paint on a healthy patch of white glue and then use a toothpick that has a bit of white glue on the tip to sort of dab a block, pick it up and stick it onto the piece. One at a time, over and over. Once you get the hang of it and you get in the groove, it actually goes pretty quick. I did this whole floor in like 20 minutes. And you need to revisit some white glue for the tip of the toothpick every, I don't know, six or seven bricks. Be sure to place the paper side up, shiny product side down. Very important for painting later on. Then I decided I really was not crazy about having the lines demarcated in the aquarium levels, so I re-smoothed those by covering them with cereal box. Now, I'm gonna flock with sand, and I need an undercolor because for the aquariums, I actually wanna leave it as natural colored sand. I'm not gonna paint it. For the middle layer, I'm looking at the artwork in the Tales from the Yawning Portal 5th edition version, and I kinda like that reddish desert hue that's going on, so I'm gonna try and replicate that. So base coating the aquariums with a khaki and base coating the, the desert middle tier with a terracotta. Now to flock the two aquariums, I got a bunch of stuff down off the shelf that might fit. I've got these green things. These are extremely fragile. They crumble upon touch. I'm not gonna use those, but these aquamarine translucent pebbles, these are pretty cool. So I'll start with those and then sand after that. Nice. And now it's time to burn down some of this old product that I've never used before. I've got some GW Martian Iron Earth, some Vallejo Effects Paint Thick Mud. I was gonna mix those two together, throw in a little bit of yellow, boost the saturation, and just make the most random texture paste from hell. I laid that down pretty thickly, gave it overnight to dry, and came back to dry brush with a vibrant orange. Riza Rust, Riza Rust, whatever. This should do the trick. And it kind of did. Um, uh, you know, I was sort of happy with it. Um, but decided to make some bulk progress elsewhere and fuddle with this later on. Graphics Arts Craft Plastic. Graphics Arts is a friend of the channel, and this is a great durable clear plastic for wherever you might need durable clear plastic. For the long sides, I just connected two pieces together with some clear packing tape. And then these are attached to create the aquarium walls with hot glue. I strived to ensure a continuous bead of hot glue on the inside so that I'd have a good seal for the upcoming resin pour. Keyword, tried. And here are some graphics medium chipboard. Medium chipboard, this is the grayish brownish stuff you find at the back of a legal pad, but you can buy it in bulk like I do if you want. Links in the video description below. Anyway, I cut some half inch wide strips pre-painted them to match the undercolor of my flocking, and then these get hot glued on to cover up that ugly portion of the wall. All right, good enough. Let's move on to the resin pour. I like to use Art & Glow. Good stuff, a little pricey, but good stuff. Important to mix it 50-50 and to mix for a good solid two minutes. It's true of this product and of any resin you might ever try to use. If you don't stir adequately enough, it can give a sticky finish or never cure. It's the number one cause. You can even be off the 50-50 a little bit. Just make sure you stir rigorously. I'm gonna tint this teal consistent with the artwork from Tales of the Yawning Portal. I'm adding a good amount here. You can see it's pretty dark. That's because when this pours out, it's gonna be a thin layer, only like a half inch thick. When it thins out, the intensity of the color decreases significantly. So I'm making it so it's very rich in this large quantity. And here comes the pour. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. Now, right after the pour, I took some blue ink, put a drop every few inches, and then used a toothpick to sort of tease it around and put some swirls into the, I don't know, texture of the water. Color variation, just something a little different. And now let me provide you a visual essay on the process of recognizing and then gracefully accepting failure. 
We come back to the project for the first time in 24 hours since walking away to let it cure. Well, f okay, really though, this happens from time to time. It's part and parcel with crafting, especially if you're going to run a YouTube channel. Rework sometimes happens, even if it means starting all over. And don't fall victim to the sunk cost fallacy. There's like $15 of resin in that thing and, you know five or six hours of work, but if you're not going to be happy with the end result and you know it, you got to cut your losses. And so let's try again. Once more with feeling, here's the other panel from that furniture backing. This time I'm going to build directly on it. I don't know why I didn't do that the first time. Careful measuring and some ledger lines and hot glue everything on there. And I can get two axes of control for everything. Within about a half hour, I had the terrace rebuilt. Much better. Then, different order this time, the very next thing I did was attach all of the clear plastic. And, right after that, I went ahead and attached the wall, uh, coverings. And instead of graphics medium chipboard, I used a much thinner cereal box. From there, same as before, get the base colors down, flock with sand, pour the resin, and so on. Now, it did spring a small leak in this corner here, but it's not too bad and I think I can paint over it. That red is still not quite working for me, so I'm going to move on and make progress elsewhere. Tin foil ball. Rolled up, texturized the foam to look like stone. Then we get on our protective initial base coat. Black paint with white PVA glue or Mod Podge or something like that. Followed by simple dry brushing. Nice healthy overbrush with a dark gray. And then a lighter dry brush with a light gray. Simple. And I'm just going to call it on this red desert. I know, I mean, I'm sitting here editing the video and actually this in the picture, this looks really good. In real life, it just didn't look right. It had a, a pink to it. I don't know. So let's go to a traditional golden rod and then let that dry and dry brush with a khaki. Followed by a nice brown wash to tie it together. And with that done, we'll just touch it up one more time with a light dry brush over the tops of that sand. And let's not forget the happy little shrubs from the inspirational artwork. And a little bit of very light gray edge highlighting on the stone, just to pop a little bit. Piece is kind of flat right now, it's kind of dark. With that done, let's turn our attention toward the creatures. I 3D printed all of these using my Elugu Mars 3 and my Anycubic Photon Mono. With both of them running, I had all of these printed in four hours. Supports pop right off and then we prime them with the best damn primer on the planet, Rust-Oleum 2X Flat Gray. Now I'm taking my usual shortcut with these. Gradients with an airbrush can make a miniature look perfectly passable. Base coats went down first. The scorpions and manticores both have stingers, so I did those up with a chaotic red, transitioning into a sharp orange. And then those same two colors for the crayfish appendages. The manticores had sort of a goldenrod base coat, and by doing a top-down only light spray of a very light beige, you catch all that fur and pop out instant detail. Scorpions are usually, like, shiny, so I hit them with gloss varnish. To enrich the saturation and get more definition on the manticores, I gave them a complete wash with this Army Painter Flesh Wash color. While that was drying, the crayfish shells get some grayish slate blue type color, and that finishes them off. The sea lions are simply two shades of green, a jade base coat and a goblin green top down. These are cool models, I like the bases. So I based those coral pieces with purple and spritzed them with a bit of cotton candy pink. And then the rest of the rock of the base is traditional brush, getting some gray on there, and washing it down with this Army Painter Purple. 
I was going to do black, but I decided purple at the last second, and I'm glad I did. It complements those coral pieces really nicely. Here's some close-ups of all four of them. So for 30 minutes of painting, not bad, right? You can cheat, you can do a lot with an airbrush. I started with a cheap Master brand, which despite the name is not for experts. It's a very cheap entry-level one. And my current one is an Iwata HPCS. But there's links in the video description below with all my recommended tools and materials. For versatility and ensuring that they'll fit in their tier of the aquariums, I'm not putting them on bases. And here we go, the whole thing set up, everyone in place, and our intrepid party has just entered the room. Let's get some glamour shots. Well, yeah, there still was a little bit of shifting of resin. Maybe the table I had it on was inherently not level. I did not check that, but it's not too bad. Really, when you're at the table, your eye is not really drawn to it. There's so much going on here, so many shapes and so many colors that you don't notice the many mistakes that are there. Making miniature terrain is kind of forgiving in that regard. The more micro detail that you add, the more it obfuscates any errors you might have made. By far though, biggest win from this whole project is those sea lions. I love the way that those came out, and there's not a single bit of layering or edge highlighting or glazing involved. Probably could have done some recess shading on the crayfish to give them a little more definition, but this video is late enough already. We gotta get it out the door. And here for posterity before I chuck it in the trash. First attempt on the right, final on the left. Rockin'. Well, thank you very much for tuning in and sticking with me on this series. Part 6 will be the final episode. It's gonna be a big one. Like and subscribe if you want to. Till next time, I'm Wylock. Make things and play games. It is done. Oh god, I'm so sick of this project. We have three rooms left to build today, one of which proved to be a boon as I made some little trinkets that ended up being some of my new favorites. And then it was out to the garage to set up the entire dungeon for the grand tour. Although I am not painting my garage floor this time. That was at the previous house. And frankly, it was my only mulligan. Roll it! Well, it's done, and I did it, and I did it, and it's done. There's really not much to say, so we're going to go straight to the crafting table. I will waste no time with a heady preamble. I will not build this up or create hype. I will give you no deluge of platitudes about what a journey it's been. I will not bloviate or wax poetic. I will respect your time and keep this viewing experience about you, not about me. I will give no reflection nor genuflection. I will not sit here and harp on things that are gonna be covered in the video anyway. I will not stall, I will not delay. We need to get right to the crafting. You've been waiting for this, I've been waiting for this, why would we procrastinate? In other words, I will not waste your time. I will not waste a single second. Moving down the hallway into room 23, the floating stream. Water not only flows through this room, it floats. Entering a hole in the western wall two feet off the floor is a stream seemingly suspended in midair. It flows out of another hole near the northeast corner. On either side of the door are a total of six kayaks, each able to carry two riders, but there are no paddles to be found. Interestingly, this room in the third edition module says several rectangular platforms lean up against the near wall. And since those are a lot easier to make than kayaks, I'm going to go with that interpretation. Here is some crafting twine and some small wooden dowels. Toothpicks would also work. I bunch about six of them together and lay down a bead of hot glue, maybe a quarter inch in from the edge, and then with plenty of excess, lay the twine down in it. And this will bind together the sticks. After doing that on each end of the raft, the loose ends can be wrapped around the top and then back to the bottom again where another dab of hot glue is used to secure them in place and the excess cut away. From there, it's a matter of painting them, and as I've said many times before, this folk art asphaltum color is just excellent for getting a rich, vibrant wood. So there we go, cheap and easy rectangular rafts. 
However, what I've also stumbled on here is I really like this aesthetic, this color combination. So for in future projects doing like forts or shanties or I don't know, anywhere I need rope and wood, I like this color combination. Gotta keep this in mind. Anyway, I made like eight or 10 of those, I can't quite remember, and hot glue them so they're leaning against the wall in the room. Now this floating stream of water that it's talking about, I'm going to use some one inch thick polystyrene to start with. Then I draw out the shape on a grid of two and a half by two and a half inch square so I know exactly where each of the two rooms is gonna begin and end. That is cut out with a hot wire, freehand, and then traced onto some chipboard, graphics medium chipboard, mana from heaven. Once that's been traced, I can cut away the sections that won't be there. So this will allow the chipboard, which is the surface of the water, to sort of float in midair. The two chunks below it are the support structure, and I'll just make them look like a tunnel wall or a cavern wall or something like that. But this way I don't need clip-ons, and I can literally like put the rafts and or the miniatures along the river if they take the battle into the tunnel, which I think is kind of the point of the encounter. We'll get to that in the next room. But anyway, to texture it up, I didn't feel like doing tin foil and waiting for Mod Podge, so I did my old hot glue trick, thick bead along the bottom, and tease it upward with the nozzle. Make it look like a droopy cavern. The paint is nothing special, I'm using my usual black and gray and barn wood for the cavern wall. And then there's a dark blue and a lake blue and a really light blue dry brush to make the water stream. Not on camera, I also hit it with some gloss varnish. And so here's the idea. You can see the wall sections meet up perfectly with the structure and chipboard is pretty rigid stuff. So over a short distance like this, it stays hovering in the air just fine. Will easily support the weight of a tiny plastic miniature as well. I wrestled for weeks with a way to do this with resin, but I couldn't figure out how to get like a curved and also cupped half tunnel or half pipe, if that makes sense. At least not without a tremendous amount of math and tedium. So I took my own advice that I've espoused multiple times recently and just acted. Gotta get over the analysis paralysis. And it looks fine, it's functional, and it's colorful. I like it. The stream goes into room 24, Sir Bluto's guard post. A fallen knight named Sir Bluto Sans Pite, a neutral evil champion, and his eight minions wait here to ambush any who come through the tunnel. It's a weird name. I think he's also a fallen knight in previous printings, but I just found eight warrior looking miniatures that I have that are the same. Base coated them with three colors and gave them a strong tone wash. The army painter method, love it. 15 minutes of work, done. So here he is, Sir Bluto Sans Pite. I have no idea what that name is supposed to be. I keep thinking it's like a pun that I'm not getting or something, but whatever. Here he is with his guard. Now there's a secret passageway connecting room 24 with the hallway to room 25. And for this I'm doing just what I did with the Tomb of Horrors secret passages. Secret passages are chipboard, two and a half inches wide, so it's a flat 2D tile and I just paint the passage in the middle and black out on either side of it. This makes it very visually striking against the normal room tiles. And by being different just adds a little something. It's also a lot easier to construct. For real long passages or complex shapes, you gotta tape multiple sections together. I just use packing tape to make hinges. Well, we did room 26 back in episode five, so we're going to move on to room 27, the luxurious prison. Lavish furnishings and decorations are everywhere in this large room. The floor is strewn with rugs and cushions and tapestries cover the walls. A hookah as tall as a human stands in one corner. The largest piece of furniture is a sumptuous divan, 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 I don't know. What is this? Ah, okay. It's a couch. It's a fancy couch. All right, so I'm thinking this room is fancier. It's finished. It's not carved out of mountain. So once again, I'm going to take a tip from myself in the Tomb of Horrors build and make this a mosaic floor. This one, instead of blue, will be tan. So it's a base coat with a cream tan flesh color. Then with multiple paint brushes of sizes and shapes and thickness, taking a light brown and streaking on some, well, streaks and then doing the same with a sienna color. Once that's totally dry, I chop them up into squares, mix them up really good, and then attach them back onto the tile. From there, I gave the whole thing a nice black wash, one part black paint to 10 parts water to tamp it all down. In hindsight, this mix was a little bit rich. It dulled it down more than I would have liked, but that's okay. Rugs, just like I did in the werewolf's room earlier. These are print and paste from Google Image Search glued onto some cereal box and then cut out and hot glued onto the floor. Now 
Now the hookah, that's interesting. I've never made one of those before. I pulled down this bin of arcane looking beads and found a few that I think would stack well together. So with a single toothpick or wooden dowel through them and some super glue, I assembled the body of the hookah. Here's some high gauge, thin black electrical wire. Actually, I think it's microphone wire. So I stripped away a little tiny bit and then hot glued it into the top. Wrapping that around decoratively so it looks sort of like the inspirational artwork from the 1E module and super gluing it to the body of the hookah and then a final bead to serve as the like pipe end. And here we go with a halfling miniature for scale. This halfling is Kesnef, who is actually an Oni or an ogre mage in previous printings, currently in disguise as a halfling. And this is a neat little trinket. I was really happy with how two minutes of work came out. I was cruising and it's really gonna fit the room well, like color palette wise, sweet. Now for the fancy couch, look at this. This is a toy finger skateboard. I'm gonna take the sticker off and pop the wheels out. And this forms a great base for the body of the luxurious couch divan, divan, divan. Then I have a jumbo popsicle stick and I'm just going to freehand draw out a curved sort of shape for the back of it. And this popsicle stick can be cut with a good fresh crafting knife or utility knife. Just using multiple passes with light to moderate light pressure. It can be done. And then a little bit of sandpaper to smooth it up. Very nice. Now this plastic needs to be primed. We're going to use God's gift to humanity, Rust-Oleum 2X Flat Gray Primer. Best spray paint on planet Earth. And this is some crafting foam uh, sheets. It's not foam board. It's very thin, very flexible, almost like a fabric. I've never used this before, but many others have. It's a popular material for crafting. It's just something I've never really liked to use. Till now, perfect for the couch cushion. So after tracing and cutting out the shapes I would need, I used a mechanical pencil with the lead retracted to sort of push in the pin cushions or I guess they'd just be the pins in the cushion. Whatever, it's this look that you see on fancy furniture. All right, and another touch, back to my wooden dowels and some of these Celtic looking beads that I found in my collection. I'll put together a headrest, two of them, one for each end of the couch. Then it was time to assemble. So I put the seat cushion on and those two headrests and reprimed it. I guess I could have waited for that. And while the primer was drying, I hit the back with my asphaltum color. Now, since the divan is described as sumptuous, I'm thinking it's made of gold. So I'll start with some Army Painter Bright Gold. Their metallics are my favorites. And then a manual brushwork to get an alien purple. This is a nice, rich, royal purple. I hit the cushions with this. Then it's time to shade everything down. Army Painter Flesh Wash, not dark tone or soft tone or brown, but their flesh wash over the gold gives a wonderful, rich, rich gold color. I love it. And of course the purple gets washed with purple tone. It's time to attach the back. So I'm gonna scrape away some of that paint. So I get raw plastic to super glue too. And then super glue is used to attach it with some patience. And then the back cushion is attached in kind. And the fancy couch is done. Well, except for one final little touch. So this little thing, it took like 30 minutes to do. And after Googling what the couch was, I saw the skateboard in my toy collection, which I haven't used in six years. Thank God I didn't throw it away because this has ended up being one of my top five favorite things I have ever made. I don't know why. I'm just so happy with how it came out. <laughs> I don't know. Again, I'm lucky that I met a woman early in life. But look at it. Isn't that cool? Miniature furniture? I don't know. It makes me want to start like a whole line of miniature furniture or dedicate a whole episode to it. I got plenty of other ideas. All right, anyway, next we're going to move on to the tapestries that are hanging on the wall. I'll be back in eight seconds. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. More Google image search and print and paste. More wooden dowels painted with asphaltum. And then these printed up tapestries, which I mirrored in Photoshop. I just fold them in half and glue them together. Easy as. Now, rather than make a whole bunch of individual clip-ons for each of these, I'd like to have a contiguous wall. So I made one of the larger clip-ons I've ever made. This thing is like 10 inches long. And I found these tassel things in the clearance section at either Michael's or Hobby Lobby, I can't remember which. 
I've had them for a couple years now, and lo and behold, thought of a use for them. Just glue them on in between the tapestries, alternating. I also bought a 3D model and printed it and painted it for the Ogre Mage portion of Kesnef. Again, it's just a 20 minute speed paint with base colors and washes over that, no highlighting. And so here's Kesnef mirrored in his halfling form and as an Oni or Ogre Mage. By the way, these were printed on my Elegoo Saturn II 8K. I did a video on that a while back. It continues to be an absolute champ for me. And as we look over this room, I'll read to you a little bit about Kesnef from the third edition printing of this module, because it is longer. Kesnef the Ogre Mage has been living here since he lost a wager with Karaptis, and he spends most of his time trying to figure out a way to pay back the wizard for this indignity. Currently, Kesnef appears to be a well-to-do halfling. He claims to be a halfling warrior named Fensik, who has been held for ransom by the horrible wizard Karaptis for several months. A detect evil spell reveals a faint evil aura emanating from him. If possible, he'd prefer to avoid combat. He's perfectly willing to accompany the characters out of the dungeon, since doing so would end his confinement. If given the opportunity, he might use his charm person ability against an unwary PC, but he only does so if he thinks he may need an extra friend. If his false identity is discovered, Kesnef immediately turns invisible and slips away to a safe corner. On the next round, he uses his slippers of spider climbing to move onto the ceiling. Once there, he uses his darkness spell-like ability to sow confusion among the characters. After a few rounds, he dismisses his polymorph effect, resumes his normal form, and retrieves his greatsword. Only then does he actually attack the characters, either using Cone of Cold or delivering a greatsword attack against a single enemy. If reduced to 10 or fewer hit points, Kesnef assumes a gaseous form and, while still cloaked in darkness, slips inside his great hookah. Oh, so that's why it's in this room. Then he simply waits until the PCs leave his chamber before returning to physical form. Lastly, escaping the dungeon. On the way back out, the party will run into two Ifrit, Nyx and Nox. So once again, I bought a 3D model, printed two of them, based with black, gave it a zenithal with some army painter uniform gray, and then white on top of that, and then layers of red and orange inks. Here's a mega close-up of them. Nyx and Nox waiting back at the entrance. As we now take the grand tour of the entire dungeon set up in its completeness, I will describe to you the legacy weapons stowed away in White Plume Mountain. There are three, and here is their lore. Black Razor, Sword of Souls. Black Razor is a great sword that appears to be forged from an unknown alloy of steel. It is sheathed in a black scabbard decorated with pieces of cut obsidian. It is a plus one weapon with a value of 2,350 gold. Omen. When held, Black Razor shines like a piece of the night sky filled with stars. Its wielder hears faint whispers whenever it delivers the killing stroke to a living creature. History. No living being can positively identify the material from which Black Razor was crafted because the sword comes from another reality now long dead whose physical laws varied from those defining the multiverse known to today's sages and planeswalkers. In the dying days of that reality, the wizard Kareptus brought the weapon out of its native multiverse into his own. In truth, Black Razor's current form is not its true shape. Originally, the Great Sword was a living creature, a native of the strange multiverse Kareptus visited. Through a strange ritual practiced by the denizens of that dimension, Kareptus bent first the entity's will and then its form until he had the weapon he desired. The rulers of Black Razor's home dimension were powerful beings who controlled all known planes of existence within their multiverse. Order was absolute. Entropy and decay of all kinds had been virtually eliminated, but despite the power these rulers wielded, their control eventually faltered, allowing horrible creatures to pour forth from forbidden realms into their multiverse and poison all of reality. In its original state, Black Razor was not a living being. It was a powerful undead creature, similar to an Atropol. In fact, the entity known as Black Razor should never have existed, either in our reality or its own. It was one of the first horrid creatures to invade that long-lost multiverse, and the rulers of that dimension were all too eager to eliminate any evidence that their control was not as absolute as they would have wished. 
Thus, they granted Caraptus the knowledge to bend the entity into its current form as payment for taking it from their realm forever. The second legacy weapon is Wave. Wave is a trident whose head is forged of steel with a distinctive blue-green sheen. The wooden haft is intricately carved with fish, twinning seaweed, and similar aquatic motifs. It is a plus one weapon with a value of 2,315 gold. Omen. Anyone who clutches wave constantly hears a sound like that of distant waves washing against some unseen shore. With a round of concentration, the wielder can sense the distance and direction to the nearest body of water of at least pond size. History. According to legend, the trident wave was forged by giants who were imprisoned on the desolate island called Thunderforge by agents of an ocean deity commonly called the Sea Queen. The first hero to wield it was the half-giant Dravenda, said to be the daughter of the Sea Queen herself, who used it in rebellion against her mother's servants and paid for her insolence with her life. Dravenda used Wave in her epic battle with an enormous crab that was supposedly another of the Sea Queen's offspring. Dravenda fought bravely, but she grew weaker and weaker as the battle raged on. Finally, while held in the crab's huge claw, she managed to hurl her trident into a gap in the creature's adamantine plating, killing it instantly. Dravenda died in battle the next day, and her kin buried Wave with her. Shortly after Dravenda's death, the notorious wizard Caraptus encountered the imprisoned giants of Thunderforge Island and agreed to help them win their freedom. In return for the magical aid he provided, the giants exhumed Wave from Dravenda's tomb and gave it to him. Caraptus carried the weapon with him in his travels before he eventually settled in the mysterious volcano known as White Plume Mountain and disappeared from history. Some 100 years ago, a group of powerful heroes calling themselves the Brotherhood of the Tome entered White Plume Mountain, fought the monsters still living there, and returned in triumph with Wave and other assorted treasures. A ranger named Elfin claimed Wave as his own and carried it during his later adventures, long after the Brotherhood of the Tome had been disbanded. Eventually, Elfin retired from the adventuring life and married, but tragedy struck on his wedding day. Shortly after he and his bride boarded the Asterion for their honeymoon journey, a sudden storm struck and the ship foundered. Elfin survived thanks to Wave's magic, but his new bride drowned, although legend says that her spirit somehow joined with the figurehead of the ship. Elfin blamed the Sea Queen for his wife's death and swore an oath of vengeance on the deity. His quest for revenge brought him at last to Thunderforge Island, the birthplace of Wave, where he confronted an avatar of the unknown, but Elfin and Wave both disappeared. Decades later, the trident reappeared in the possession of a wealthy collector. The third and final legacy weapon is Whelm. Whelm is a plain, unadorned warhammer with a haft made from the golden wood of the ginkgo tree. When the weapon is wielded, its steel head glows with a soft, silver-black light. Omen. Whelm glows more brightly when you endeavor to assess items of value. The more valuable the item, the brighter the glow. This effect grants you a bonus on appraisal checks. History. The hammer known as Whelm appeared most recently about 20 years ago in a dwarven community beset by ogres, though no report of its creation by those dwarves exists. Wielded by a dedicated dwarf soldier named Ketenmir, the weapon proved quite powerful against the clan's enemies. Ketenmir later left his ancestral home to become an adventurer, and he and the weapon promptly disappeared from sight. Long ago, Dagnall Mightyhammer was a skilled weaponsmith of the Dankill clan. She labored at a time when her clan had suffered grievous losses from a large band of vicious trolls. When her husband and shieldmate Traubon decided to lead a counterattack against the trolls, Dagnall created a mighty warhammer, which had no name at the time, putting all her love for her husband, her commitment to her clan, and her devotion to Moradin into it. Traubon and his warriors proved victorious, and Dagnall's weapon was much praised. In the years of prosperity that followed, Dagnall imbued the Warhammer with the ability to sense gems, gold, and other riches, so that it might become a valuable tool in both wartime and peacetime. 
Many years later, the dwarves were threatened by hordes of goblins led by bugbears. Dagnall, now an old woman, again sought to improve her masterpiece so that it might help vanquish the current threat. Traubon, though he was old and in less than perfect health, insisted on going out with the vanguard of the counterattack. The dwarves were again victorious, but Traubon was mortally wounded in the fight. The weapon was returned to the clan with its owner for burial. Overcome by grief, Dagnall threw herself on her husband's corpse and promptly died. The two dwarves and the weapon were interred together in a single grave. At the time, many said that the three had shared one spirit, and that Dagnall and Trabon had put so much of themselves into the weapon that it had become much more than just steel and wood. Well, what a ride. And if somehow this is your first exposure to, like, making stuff for your miniature tabletop gaming, you should know there is a group of 40,000 strong on Facebook, the Tabletop Crafters Guild. Lots of resources there to get you started. Also, in my video backlog, I have all kinds of projects, including a couple videos aimed at absolute newbies, people who have zero assets diving in for the very first time. If you want to support me, there's links in the video description below. You got Patreon and Amazon, but uh, my modules for D&D &D are on Etsy and or the DMs Guild. If you want to support me one time cheaply, that's a good thing to do. Check out the modules. They're pretty good. They're not great, but not bad. You know, they're good. Thank you so much for watching. I will now rest. I'm Wylock. Make things and play games. Mm -hmm.